you for taking the time to be with us today and uh, and helping our little initiative grow. Oh my goodness! Thank you for hosting me. This is a wonderful opportunity. I, I'm in a launch season as well, so anything I can do to put my face in more places and get people thinking about the book that's coming out that works for me too. But I, I love these sort of grassroots. Um, initiatives, right? We are all scrambling to figure this thing out right now. And uh, I mean, I'm planning an online launch. My original launch was going to be in person, of course. Um, but of course, I'll, you know, there's nothing happening in person, hardly. So, so no, it's great. I'm, I'm quite appreciative and I'm becoming quite empathetic for people who are, who are doing this kind of thing, because it really is a, a real pivot and it's a shift for everybody, isn't it? Right, right. Um, this is a teacher me talking, so we're going to start with an icebreaker question, right? Sure. Uh, because one thing that I have uh, loved discussing with authors is what is your favorite font? I know that sounds like a crazy question to begin with, but I find a lot of people are quite passionate about the fonts they use. Well, they are, and, and actually, I'm a former high school English teacher myself, so That's right. That's I'm actually right. going to scaffold my response. Um, I, I, have, I have numerous favorite fonts. I think for my writing, when I need to proofread, when I need to put things down in draft form, I'm a big fan of Times New Roman. It's the most boring one, but it's also one of the most readable for myself and for people who receive my writing. So that's my favorite writing one. But um, when I'm designing things, and I, and I do dabble a little bit in design, um, I'm particularly fond of the Helvetica family. Okay. Uh, classic sans serif font, uh, works in so many different situations, works online, but it also works for large print as well. Um, I also have a, a current favorite uh, because the designer of the cover of my book, Sophie Pass Lang from Dundurn, she, um, she used, it was a little bit of a mission for me to find it. <laughs> but she used for my Brent Ben Staldine and on the bottom of the cover. So this font here, uh, near as I can tell, I haven't asked her yet. I've been geeking out on, a, on my own, but it's Gil Sons. So right now that's a current favorite because she picked a, a font for the cover that I had never seen before. Well, I might've seen it, but I never really noticed it. Um, right. and it's perfect. You know, I love the cover as it is, of course, I have a gorgeous cover, but, uh, so pet project was to discover that font. So there you go. Three different fonts for three different purposes. And uh, I'll, I'll now go into my visual learners. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh, no, that's, that's actually perfect. Now, I haven't had a chance to read your book. Mm -hmm. So could you uh, introduce the, uh, the novel to uh, our listeners? Sure. Give it's Boy. The title is Boy. Uh, and he's, and the, the title is named after the protagonist of the novel, who's also named Boy. Uh, his mother has a very quirky way of looking at the world through the lady, through the, sorry, excuse me, through the, the lens of the 80s. And so she named him after Boy George. Um, oh. But it's a story about his final year of high school. Uh, he's having a heck of a year. He's got problems in the family. He's also dealing with uh, the loss of being an air cadet because he's 18 years old. So he had to retire from that. That was his life for a long time. He's figuring out what he's going to be doing after high school. Uh, in addition to helping raise a, a half brother that unexpectedly arrived in the family um, through some some choices from his mother uh, and another gentleman and uh, and so this is all sort of spiraling in the novel um, much like a lot of 18 year olds are facing it feels like that nexus of craziness but then he meets a man who can stop time uh, at least he can it seems he can stop and restart time at will and so boy has to not only negotiate the ins and outs of daily challenges, uh, his teenager challenges, his new adult challenges that are on the horizon, but he has to not navigate that he's met this person who can do this thing and figure out what does it really mean when someone can do that. Uh, and so the big questions in the novel, in addition to having a story and characters that you cheer for or root against or whatever, um, the novel also deals with questions of time and how we we approach time and what time means. So one of the questions that Dundurn came up with, excellent little tagline for the novel is, if you could stop and restart time, hoping for a second chance, would you? And that's a very good central question. So the book's about those things. It's about a kid going through a heck of a final year of high school, but it's also pointing at a lot of uh, life issues for the reader as well in terms of how time is approached. Actually, there was a lovely review um, 
just posted in the Hamilton Review of Books too, that was so perceptive and such a sensitive take on the novel that was just so, I was just so pleased to encounter it. And um, the reviewer just said, it's a very good novel for right now because of all of the, the idea of pausing, because the idea that time feels weird right now and it's kind of an eerie, it doesn't really feel like now, you know, how we pause back in March and have we ever, have we really started up again, you know? So that was quite fun too. So that's what the novel's about. So now you've got me completely intrigued. Um, it's, can I ask about like the inspiration or, or what idea first snowballed into your book? Well, as with, with many of my stories and my books, I get a central image that sort of bounces around in my brain um, and won't leave me alone. And in this case, uh, it was the image of a man living under a highway in a culvert, a homeless man living in a culvert. Uh, and once I started to look into that image and try to figure out why that image was speaking to me so much, um, another image popped into my mind, and that was the image of a boy sitting on the rock who has just received good news that's not really good news because of all of the stuff that's going on in his life. Uh, and so those two images have combined to form what the core of the novel is. Boy is the boy on the rock. He, uh, he's just received an acceptance to his university of choice, the military school he applied to. However, because he's spending so much time caring for his new half brother, his grades are slipping. So it's a bittersweet moment. Uh, and then, the character under the highway in the culvert, his name is Mara. Uh, and I pictured him as a disgraced priest or a minister, somebody who, who would have um, had people he was responsible for in a faith perspective. And, uh, and when they get together, that's when the book started for me. And that's actually the opening scene too, where they meet. So, I'm a little curious about the process of mm -hmm. uh, like just writing um, is first of all, may I ask how long it took for you to write this novel? Well, it's a, Oh, that's a, it's always an interesting question, isn't it? Because um, there's, there's really two answers. The one answer is from the first time I had that image in my brain to right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably seven years. Um, the actual writing of it didn't take that long. Mm -hmm. It was my thesis through the University of British Columbia's MFA program. Okay. Um, and so I was, uh, sorry, excuse me, I was actually able to get the draft done uh, in, I guess, about a year. Um, but of course, there's lots of revisions and that kind of thing as well. So that was from 2013 to 2015 when I graduated. And by the time I graduated, it was mostly in the form that it is now, except for final editing and polishing. Uh, and then there was a five year pause where I tried to find agents and submitting and all of that stuff. And so the second part of the answer is, well, about five years because I was done from when I was drafting it to when I was actually ready to put it in the world and would call it more or less finished. So. It's a tough one. This one actually took a lot longer than my other novel, the first novel, Saints Unexpected. That was very straightforward. I did National Novel Writing Month. I drafted it, pounded it out, and submitted it and had it published. You know, it was a fairly straightforward process. This one was a little more convoluted and took a little more time. Yeah. And I think this is really important for um, readers, especially readers who want to write to, uh, to know and appreciate, because a novel um, can take years right in the writing right um but so you know how i sent you all these questions but now sure. i have yeah. other questions so it's going to completely uh, because now i'm uh intrigued you did your mfa mm -hmm. so may i ask uh what uh it's what cost you to want to stick um do your mfa i'm just curious now well, the initial desire was to get a degree that I could use to teach creative writing. Mm. Um, I recognized that I wanted to shift from teaching full time to finding other things to teach and to spend more time writing. And then my, one of my old professors from Redeemer University reached out and said, look, one of our creative writing professors is retiring and we are looking at filling his slot. Um, but you, and we'd be interested to talk to you about it, but you'd need to have the terminal degree. So you'd need to have the master's for creative writing. Uh, and so that's why I started it. Um, it did become more, far more than that, though. It really became a good kick in the pants for my own self-discipline. Uh, it really forced me to meet deadlines, which I'd never had before writing-wise. I, 
I just wrote and I would submit. And occasionally I would write for publications and that kind of thing, but I never sort of had this constant need to produce fiction and creative nonfiction. And so the MFA also became a real way for me to um, work on my discipline and my craft as well. And then there's the fun side of it where I, I, it's also nice to meet other writers, right? And I'm a shy person by nature. I like people and I'm good with people, but as an introvert, I don't go out to find people on my own and getting thrown into the sort of the crucible of, a, of an MFA program, even though it was distance education through UBC, it was a real good way to meet people like me, you know, in my tribe. And uh, so it's become, it became of that as well. And yeah, but it started with the desire to get that degree, um, you know, just so I could teach, which I did end up using for that. So that was a success. Uh, but it really very quickly became a lot more. I realized that it was really good for me. Um, and as a result, I've produced so much over the last, I started it in 2013, graduated in 2015, but since 2013, it's just really forced me to produce. So yeah, I hope that That's answered the question. I feel like that was a little meandering, but. No, no, meander all you'd like, it's awesome. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, because uh, I also did my, I started my MFA in 2013 as well. So like we were leading parallel lives, right? Not knowing each other. Um, I actually did mine through, um, I also did long distance. Uh, I did it at uh, National University in San Diego, California. Okay. Um, just because I want, because I had uh, studied creative writing um, here in Toronto through the continuing education program at uh, yep. University of Toronto. And I also did Humber School of Writers. So I, I thought it would be kind of uh, cool to try an American university. And my big takeaway from my MFA program in uh, was that Canadian literature and Canadian authors are amazing. Almost half of the what I read in this American MFA program was Canadian. Cool. And, and it, luckily, uh, Alice Munro had uh, also won the Nobel Prize for literature. Like the timing was just amazing. That's and great. I was actually introduced to a lot of Canadian authors through. So, um, and I think um, it's interesting to when I meet people who want to write and they're very eager to write quickly, right? They want to write a book and they want to get it published. Yeah. And sometimes I feel they don't appreciate how much um, skill and how much uh, of it's a craft like you have to de develop your craft and learn your craft yeah and yeah, um, yeah so yeah those yeah. overnight successes we uh, we read about them you know that uh, I think the most recent one was a kid who was I don't know eight years old he got a book contract for poetry um, so we hear about those overnight successes but it that, that's so rare right we don't we don't like those people very much they don't have overnight <laughs> we had you know no. we we tolerate them and uh, we certainly enjoy the boost to the business, you know, but uh, for the rest of us who are slogging away in the trenches, yeah, it's true. It really is quite a process that, that, you know, you're sitting in front of your computer and you're creating, which that to me, that's my happy place. Mm -hmm. um, but to extend that to actually say, right, I would like to get this writing in front of other people. That's a whole different animal. That is something. And again, actually, that's something that, that really, um, UBC doing my MFA, I'd also taught me that. You taught, taught me a little bit about the subscription, not subscription, the submitting side of things and getting the work out there and um, the joy and the curse that that is, you know. Um, so I get that. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's an, I mean, it's an education, uh, pun, pun, pun. But, it, but it's also an education in terms of, of learning there's so much more to writing than just writing. Right. I find... Um I've taken so many courses on how to write, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing prepared me for life on the other side. And mm -hmm. I often wonder, and I actually did ask a creative writing director, why isn't there a course for life after you publish, <laughs> right? And yeah. you know, his response was because uh, there's not a lot of people who would be able to take the course. Like mm -hmm. there isn't. Um, because again, I find the stresses of dealing with uh, it's one thing to deal with rejection, right? Like I think we're used to that as authors, but then you're reading bad reviews and there's that constant pressure. And you said if, if you are shy or if you are an introvert to do all the public uh, engagements and to be on, like there's nothing that really prepares you for even how to dress for like an interview, right? Yes, so, yes you should wear pants. Yes. You know, so how have well, you been, is magic for that, you know? <laughs> 
So how has life been for you now? Because this is, like you said, uh, your second work, and you've got another work that will be out, right? Uh, Two more. I have, uh, yeah, well, in including this one, I have three books coming out. Coming so. out, which is amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. How do yeah. you juggle? Um, how do you manage knowing that, okay, you've got this on the run, you've got this, and you have to find, like, how do you manage the stresses of everything that is not writing but right. it's still a part of a writer's job. Literally in the moment that it's happening. Um, thankfully, I married somebody who's an excellent planner. Okay. So some of her excellence has rubbed off on me in terms of my planning ability. So I'm thankful for that. But generally speaking, it's just, uh, just getting it done as needs be. Um, yeah, that's, that is a tough thing. Uh, although, I, I, again, I'll, I'll go back a bit to the MFA program I took because it was distance education. And the UBC program is unique in that you don't have to go to the residencies on campus in the summer. You can do it all through distance education. And so even then, I was learning to balance my writing with coursework, obviously, but also the fact that I, I also work at the Hamilton Public Library. Um, right. I was also teaching classes in writing. And so I was already figuring out how to balance producing writing, figuring out what I'm going to do with the books that I've written, and, and living too. Uh, in fact, while I was doing my MFA, I had my first novel accepted. And so I had to balance not only finishing my coursework and everything, I had to figure out, okay, when am I going to get editing in for, for Saints Unexpected, my first novel? And so... I was actually editing every morning when I was in British Columbia for coursework, right? I would set my alarm for five in the morning and I would edit till eight in the morning. Uh, thankfully, I'm a morning person, so that works for me. Uh, and then I would go to, go to classes and later in the day, I would connect with my family on FaceTime. And so you're, you're juggling all of these things and it really is, yeah, I wish I had a magic formula for it. Um, the only magic formula I have is about the actual writing itself. And for me, that's just about protecting the time. And for me, as I mentioned, I'm a morning person. My wife has been great about saying, the morning is yours. I'll get the kids up and breakfasted. You take over at 8.30, um, especially during COVID, because I've been home on leave from the library and I take over and she works full time. You know, so I have that time to produce. And so that's been absolutely magic in terms of my actual output. And that has a lot of credit due there for being able to produce work and, you know, in, over the course of six years now I'll have four books out and so that's, that's amazing yeah it, it really is thank you and I, I I'm just I'm so thankful I'm a morning person and that works out for our schedule at our house um, and then there's all the other stuff right there's the there's the administrivia there's the emails there's the website updating there's social media there's all that other stuff and then I go back to that in the moment if I have a moment to do something I will um, but generally all of that stuff takes backseat to life writing the new stuff gets a bit of priority in the morning obviously if there's an emergency at home then that takes priority but that writing time is sacred um, and that time is sacred so occasionally i'll pivot in the mornings too and i'll do some of that administrivia knowing i will have that time and right now actually i'm doing a lot of prep for my launch and stuff during that time so i'm actually not creating a whole lot right now just because i have to get ready for putting a book into the world so right. it's there's no magic answer it's just right. uh Thankful I have a supportive home that allows me to do it. A partner who says, you got this and I got this and we'll figure it out. Um, thank you, Rosalie. And, uh, and my kids too. Thank you, Nora and Alita. They, uh, they're they very supportive as well. And I, yeah, I wish I had that answer. But it is a real, a real juggling act, isn't it? It really, finding that time. However you feel it when it comes to the writing life, so. I, um, yeah, no, it's just, um, yeah. I've never, I haven't yet found a course or anything that, yeah. because that's a question I get asked a lot, right? Is that um, how do you know how to deal with things that you just cannot anticipate because mm. like, you just mm. don't know? Yeah. But um, so then, what is one piece of advice you would give to anyone who says to you, I want to write, right? Um, I'm an avid reader. Uh, what would you, where should I start? Especially because times are so crazy right now. Yeah. So yeah. What would, how would you begin to advise anybody? Because we do get a lot of people who want to write listening in. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's, 
it's a little bit of tough love, um, but I would tell my writing students this as well. You know, you can't call yourself a writer unless you actually write something. So ass and chair, find time to make that happen. Put a few words together every time you sit down. Um, it doesn't have to be every day, you know, but when you do, put something down, even if it's not good. In fact, a lot of the time it won't be good. That's, that's the nature of first drafts, but get your bum in your chair and write. Uh, and then, you know, we'll figure out what to do with that writing afterwards. Like, don't let that eventual, the publication side of things, don't let that affect you while you're drafting. Just get the writing done, enjoy that part of it, that miraculous part of creation. Uh, and then at the end, you're gonna find yourself with some words and you gotta figure out what you're gonna do with those words. Um, and then, you know, we'll talk a little more about submitting and, and, and that kind of thing. But first, get the writing done. Just do it, because that's the magic, right? So. Right, right. That's it's very abstract, I know. And it, no, 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 no. I, writing I, is magical, you know, but it, 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 that's it. You've got to get the actual words on the page. And until you do, right. it doesn't matter how many people you know, you know, you can pitch a, an unfinished book if you're really, really lucky and maybe they'll buy an unfinished book. But generally nowadays, especially fiction writers, you have to have a manuscript or you have to have a story ready. And at a polish to a point when it's readable, uh, in order to get it looked at, in order to get it published. So, you know, occasionally we'll hear about those celebrities and stuff who get big book deals just on an idea. And great, you know what? Right. It's nice to know that that possibility exists. But for the rest of us mortals, it's just about getting the words on the page, polishing it up to a point when people can read it, and then putting it out there. So, so who gets to read uh, your work first? Like, do you go to a beta reader? Do you have? Does it? Is it your wife? Are you? Who, who gets to see Brent's raw first The draft? raw stuff? <laughs> nobody gets to see my raw stuff. So when I, like if I draft a novel or a story, nobody sees the first draft except Interesting. for Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I would show Rosalie, my wife. She is my first reader after that. Okay. Um, I have no, nothing to hide from her. She has yeah. seen my writing at its worst. She's seen <laughs> me at my worst, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, why would I hide my writing at my worst when she's actually literally seen me nothing nothing hidden so um but she's my first reader and she's excellent she's a very very good reader uh and she's always very good about helping me get the draft polished to the point where i could show it to other people and then it depends if it's a short story i can show it to a friend uh a writing friend because it's short uh, if it's a if it's a novel length then i spend some more time with it and then i will polish it and i will polish it and then i have a trusted few very few people who will look at my manuscript length work and and then I lean on what they say so it, it's changed a little bit since I've had a publisher I find that um, the editing it's uh, how do I say this it's um that hurdle of getting someone else other than your first reader or your family <laughs> or or you know your writing group to look at it that hurdle of getting over it by, by having a novel published I found that publishers are much will more willing to have a look at a draft that might be a little rougher than it would have been if it had been before I had my first novel published. So there's a good thing to add on to the writing advice part is if you're, if, if a person is drafting his or her own um, first draft of a novel, get it polished as much as humanly possibly before you start putting it out there and showing other people, I would say, just because right now there's so much competition. Um, yeah. Make it as nice as possible and as readable as possible. And then people will give you a better response too. So there you go. So I have my first reader, Rosalie. I have my sometimes second readers, another little crew, a little stable of people who I trust. And then after that, it's the editors at whichever publisher happens to be taking a chance on my work at that given moment. So, Brett, you are such a teacher because yeah. you, you start by introducing a topic. Right. You elaborate on the topic and then you finish by summarizing. This and lecture recapping. you have learned, yeah. You are. That's brilliant. <laughs> So at this point, can I ask then what can readers do? How can we support you right now? Do you have any upcoming events? Do you have your book launch? Is there anything, anything else you want to share with us uh, so that uh, readers can know? Uh, is there, what can we do? Yeah, it's uh, by the book. Obviously, that's the first thing. It's most helpful because... <clears throat> because that sends a signal to the publisher that the book is worth having in their, mar in their uh, library. Um, but, you know, follow me on social media. Um, you know, link my website, bookmark it. 
Um, go to your library, put a hold on my work at the library. It's available there too. Um, so that's for me. And that's, that's really obvious stuff. Uh, if you see me on the street, give me a thumbs up and say, liked your book. That's always nice. Uh, but, but, Truthfully, also support the other writers, you know, the other people like me who are emerging writers who, who are, you know, finding out that the writing world is difficult um, and give, give them a leg up, buy their books too, because it all, especially in Canada, it's such a small writing community here that when we build each other up or when we, you know, when one of us has a success, it often means another person has a success. And so that's nice too. support all of us, not just me, but obviously please buy my book. <laughs> Do you I have a, a favorite bookstore in Hamilton? Hamilton is such a remarkable city. Agreed. Yeah. Oh I'm, my a, gosh. I'm a recent import. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I grew think, up in Ottawa. So I think Hamilton, I um, am very fortunate. I sit on Gritlet's uh, program advisory team. Very nice. Excellent. And so I've gotten to know Hamilton a little bit, right. Mm -hmm. But just, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's one of the most extraordinary cities and uh, there's amazing spots. Do you have a favorite bookstore? Or do you want to shout out any where we could, uh, readers can order? Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I would agree with you. It's a really neat place to be a part of right now. It's really emerging. It's small enough that all the writers are really supportive of each other. Um, we basically all know each other, which is really cool. Um, same with the bookstores. We only have a handful of them. So I'll start with the bookseller who's been the most support with me is Epic Books on Lock nice. Street. Hi, Jamie. Um, she's going to be doing the book selling for my launch and she'll be able you can personalize the books and everything, which is kind of cool. But there's King West books and J.R. J.H. Gordon books, um, the city and the city bookstores as well. It, it, all of the small bookstores. And then Ian at uh, sorry, different drummer books in Burlington is also a big, uh, yay, different drummer. We have so many great um, champions of the author to choose from uh, in the city and in the area. So, but I, you know, if I had to pick one, it'd obviously be Epic Books because she is my bookseller, and uh, yeah, she's going to be running the show on the launch. So we're really excited about that. That's amazing. My yes. final question is: You have sure. so many books behind you, I right? Do. You yes, have I do. fabulous books. Is there, if you had to pick one book there from uh, to recommend for me to read, pick. what would it be? Oh wow! Ah. Uh. And I will check it out. Do you want me to give you the cover? I think I've got it here. Do I still have it here? Uh, let's see. This is making for very good, uh, very good Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> be, be turning the back to the camera. Yeah, nope, there it isn't. Where did it go? Maybe I lent it out to somebody already. There it is. All right. So this book has rocked my world. Uh, came out a few years ago. It's called The End We Start From okay. by Megan Hunter. Very short little book. It's, it's a book about uh, in, in London, England, that experiences a catastrophic flood. And the story is about a woman who's pregnant, uh, and she has to navigate what it's like to try and survive in that kind of environment. So that's my first. Actually, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to okay. do one more. Okay. This is exciting. Actually, we should start a new, uh, new series. The yes. author recommends. Yes, the author, the author pulls it off the bookshelf. Um, this one also has the distinction of being the very best title, my personal favorite title of all books. I just absolutely love this title. It's called Our Hearts Will Burn Us Down. That's poetry. Wow. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? And it's by a writer named Anne Valente. She's actually blurbed my second novel coming out in oh. February. But this is, a, this is a book about a school shooting. Uh, and okay. it's just, wow. it's gorgeously written. Okay. It's super empathetic, heartbreaking, but it's, it's such, a, such a good book to read. Um, yeah, I can't, can't sing this one's praise hard, highly enough. And my, my novel coming out is a YA novel, and it's also dealing with the aftermath of a school shooting. And so Anne has actually very, been very gracious about lending her time. And she actually read the draft so, of uh, Nothing But Life. So there's another I, set of readers, authors that I want to blurb my book. So add that to the list there. Oh my gosh. I'm really excited to uh, actually read Boy. And, you know, I'm in a high school setting. So I, I would love to introduce them. So you know what? It would be really cool at some point to get you into the classroom. Absolutely. Right? And, well, uh, and that's one of the things I'm hoping to do with the Authors Book Club um, affiliation now is to, now that the school year is going to be ramping up again, uh, and one of the advantages of having it all online now is that I can reach out to the teachers that I worked with overseas in Korea and Kuwait oh and these places and, and they can host me, 
you know, assuming the time difference isn't too crazy, but, but that you can't do that with a physical book. They're not going to, you know, fly right. a guy out for a book club, but they can, they can invite me in for a zoom meeting. Right. So very, very cool. And I'd love to do it. You know, it's, just, it's great. Yeah. Oh get, get the word out there. Thank you so much. Oh my, my God. Pleasure. Brad, this is amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>